We've been covering post-revolutionary Sierra Leone for at least the last three years. Well, it's time to go back and find out just how it's recovering. And the guest tonight's got the straight scoop because he just got back from Sierra Leone. Greg Gorley tonight, right here on Public Exposure, I'm Stan Emmert. Greg, welcome back to the show. Thank you. It's good to be back. Good to be back in Seattle from and Africa. I, and I think that uh, you're wearing something that you got there, right? Right. It was made by uh, one of the amputee soccer players who's my tailor over there. Oh, okay. Muhammad, I'm very pleased. This is very typical. All right. Now, let's, uh, we need to get to our graphics, if we could, because uh, we need to take people to where it is. First off, it's in the western part of Africa on the coast. And a lot of people may know of Casablanca and Morocco. Well, then Sierra Leone is a little bit further south. But let's then go to the next map because the next map, isn't it interesting that the name of the biggest city in Sierra Leone is called Freetown, considering its history? Considering its history, that's right. And uh, that's where the British, after the um, release of many of the slaves, chose to take people back to, to release them back into Africa, was in Freetown, Sierra Leone, underneath the cotton tree in Freetown. Now, what were you doing in Sierra Leone? I went back this time to uh, work again on education and medical programs and also uh, food security, as I'd done before. I wanted to uh, see many of the families I'd met before, visit with many of the amputees, the young uh, men and women who I'd met in the UN amputee camps, mm -hmm. also to get back up into the village area where uh, I'm an honorary paramount chief. Now, this is gruesome stuff, but you mentioned amputees. There are a lot of amputees, and we'll actually get to that a little bit later, but why are there more amputees in Sierra Leone than other places? Well, the amputation of people, the t physically and forcibly taking of a limb, was done to scare people, to discourage much of the populace from siding with the government. And it was not unusual for child soldiers to be brought in, to be drugged, given machetes, axes, uh, AK-47 sent to a village and said, you will chop off the arms and legs of men, women, and even children in their cradles and stack up the limbs in the middle of the, of the uh, villages. And how long ago was this? Really, it's uh, the peace treaty that was signed was no, is no more than about four years old. That war lasted almost 11 years, and it was a, a war over diamonds and control. And, those, and the diamonds were... Actually, what a lot of people can, uh, they, they talk about blood diamonds being in Liberia, which is, is an adjacent uh, country, but actually there's diamonds in Sierra Leone as well. Well, there's diamonds in Sierra Leone, and there, were, there are no diamonds to speak of in Liberia. But you had Charles Taylor publishing the uh, exporting of diamonds, but they were diamonds he was picking up and bringing back into Liberia from Sierra Leone, hmm. where he would send his troops. Now, you mentioned <coughs> the government would drug uh, young people and then create soldiers out of them and give them machetes and axes and then they would go and do heinous things. It, it, w it was actually the government itself that well, was Well, it was the that? rebels, the rebels there. Oh. But in these, this particular war in Sierra Leone, there are no white hats, Stan. There was bad done on every side and there were many sides in that war. Not only the UN forces and the African forces and the rebel forces and the forces of the government of Sierra Leone, everybody had their hands in the dirt. Well, what were they fighting over? A lot of it had to do with control of government. A lot of it had to do with uh, resources. Well, it's a poor country. I mean, if you control government, you control poverty. Big, and you know. But there's a chance for a few people to get rich quickly. I and see. see as few people who could buy others to do the fighting for them, and they did. Well, let's go to daily life right now, as, as you saw it in Sierra Leone. And you were primarily in Freetown, is that right? Right, this last trip. Uh, if we could, this first picture here is a, a, a woman, presumably a mother, with her, uh, I think, baby daughter in a really small bathtub. Mm -hmm. not, not a bad-looking house, actually. But then the next shot really kind of shows, I think, the area that she's living in, and that looks like just squalor to me. It is squalor. It's a refugee camp. The water is bad. The food is limited. The housing conditions... Uh, the homes that are there have zinc roofs. And I tell you, when the monsoon season begins and the rain starts coming, there's nothing louder than the rain on those zinc roofs. Mm. Um, and everybody gets soaked and wet. I see some cars, but I don't see a whole lot of roads. Well, the, what roads there are, are are just filled with holes. They're not uh, paved roads or asphalt at all. Mm. It, uh, it's very difficult to drive. and. I see what looks like our electrical lines, but only a very few. Is there full electrification in Sierra Leone? No, Serial? that's one thing that's not improved. In the very first trip I made there, 
back in 2001. Mm -hmm. We were fortunate to have electricity in the capital city for three to four hours a day. We still are fortunate to have three to four hours worth of electricity in the capital city. Well, forgive me, but you said that's one thing that's not improved. I didn't see a whole lot of, of attractive parts just from what we saw right there. The, uh, there isn't. There is not. Mm -hmm. um, the improvements that have occurred have not been the type of improvements that bring employment. Now, I saw a lot of cell towers when I was there because that you do have more communication being able to make phone calls up into the, uh, the tribal areas, up in the mountains. But when it comes to jobs... So you can discuss your poverty with others. You can by discuss telephone. your poverty with others. But there aren't jobs. Hmm. Really. Let's continue on with daily life, though, because the next picture is a picture from a school, or several pictures, actually, we have from a school, and kind of looks sort of typical. A lot of kids, except they're all dressed in uniforms. Uh, and you visited this school. I visited this school. This particular school is in the Kissy part of Freetown. Over 900 students. And Stan, notice the number of children that are there. That's one class, one teacher. American teachers have none to complain about in respect to class load because those teachers there were doing well, but they were struggling with 80 children yeah, as an well, average in their classes. I don't think it's really fair to compare Sierra Leonean schools to U.S. schools at this point in any event. I mean, isn't this, though, an improvement over what you saw in 2001? I mean, did they really have schools and uniforms and all that kind of stuff in 2001? Or? They, they did have the, some schools, some, that were, they were able to rebuild. They had some uniforms. Now, Sierra Leone is a former British colony, and much of the British way of doing things with uniforms still remains in Sierra Leone. Yeah, let's actually go to the next picture because these are some older school children, look to be uh, teenage girls. And they're, that's a typical uniform that the girls would wear because it's the color that helps identify which particular school in Freetown or elsewhere these girls attend. And when school lets out at noon for the, some of the children, it's very identifiable to see large groups of children walking home. Are these public schools? Are they religious sponsored schools, you know, like Catholic schools? or so There's some of both. You've got the um, government-operated schools that are there. You've got the Catholic school system. And then you've got a very private Protestant school system there. Hmm. And an increasing Protestant school system because the Protestant churches want to have schools where they don't have to accept the teachers, the government sends in. In other words, if they had a pro government pro provided school, they'd have to accept Muslim teachers. And they would have to accept the books from the, from the government. Well, let me ask this. Is the, <clears throat> is the, from a religious standpoint, is the country primarily Muslim? Is it primarily Christian? Is it anything? Is well, that important? It is important uh, for this reason. Sierra Leone has had, for the most part, a very congenial, congenial relationship between Muslims and Christians. Up until this present president, Ahmed Kaba, there was a Christian president leading Sierra Leone. Kaba is the first Muslim president. And that in particular has caused some problems after he has been in office because he has said publicly, with the help of Arab banks and associations, that he will build 2,000 mosques in Sierra Leone before he leaves office. And to do so, they are condemning and taking over much of the property and some of the former church buildings held by the Protestant churches. And there's been a real conflict. I witnessed several fires when I was there this last time and also had conversations with many of the uh, pastors. So one revolution is over, but is another one brewing? Another one is brewing, I believe, in respect to religious differences. And this next election, which will be a national election for president, will determine if they can hold an election free of conflict. I want to go to the next graphic because it's, it's really interesting uh, to me in two ways. One, a force for good uses condoms. So first off, and it says beware, HIV AIDS is, is real. Now, two questions. Number one, what it says. I mean, is this a big push, the, the use of, of, some, of condoms for, to prevent the spread of AIDS? But number two, that's in English. Is English their language? English is the main language that's spoken. You do have some of the tribal languages, and you do have Creole, which is a combination of English and tribal language. But again, going back to Sierra Leone originally being a British colony, English is the first language that's uh, spoken. It's used in official documents. It's used in uh, school. And um, you have no trouble conducting business in Freetown, Sierra Leone with English. Oh, okay. Uh, now, 
the, the uh, issue on the merits of substance with regard to that billboard, uh, condoms and HIV AIDS, uh, is HIV AIDS a big problem in Sierra Leone? It is a big problem. Sierra Leone is probably has one of, one of the highest percentages of uh, its population with, uh, with AIDS. Yeah, if, uh, if you can remember the map of Africa, two countries over to the right on the map from Sierra Leone is Niger, and Niger is well known as, as having a huge uh, percentage of its, uh, oh, thank you very much. Niger is uh, in sort of light green there in the middle, and I'm sorry that I don't have a, a way to show you, but it's light green, it's in the middle, it's right above the yellow, uh, the countries in yellow, and there's a huge percentage of its male population that has HIV AIDS, and of course, that spreads to the females as well. But you're saying that Sierra Leone has a problem almost as bad it as Niger? A, it has a problem, but they're beginning to address it, which four years ago when I was there was almost a taboo subject. Really? Who but is the they? There, you say there. Uh, the school system, even the tribal chiefs, did not want to admit or discuss yeah. that there was this problem. But what I saw this last time, they would have various schools that would have uh, parades through town with their school band and then the kids marching, and they're handing out condoms. Hmm and throwing condoms into the cars. Who's I'm talking openly about it now. Who's the they, though, that you're talking about from they are beginning to address it? Who's the they? Is it the schools? Is it the government? It's the government along with the World Health Organization, along with the assistance from the United Nations and various non-government organizations, some right here in Seattle, such as um, World Vision, hmm. which has a program now openly to educate people on AIDS and to assist with that and to discuss uh, ways to, av to avoid but, I mean, is it, is it fair to say that the people of Sierra Leone realize that, that AIDS is a death sentence? More so now than it was four years ago, yes. Okay, we gotta take a real short break. Just wanted to remind everyone, we're talking with Greg Gorley, who is, uh, has been with us on several occasions, uh, oftentimes coming back or relating to Sierra Leone. Sierra Leone is a country which had a very, very difficult, brutal, violent revolution. Uh, that uh, spanned a decade that ended approximately four years ago and Greg has just come back from Sierra Leone and he is telling us more about it. Oh, again, getting back to daily life, you spoke very early in the show about very little employment. I'd kind of like to show a picture of some men doing woodwork um, and you know, is this what you is this what a lot of men do for a living? Some. I mean, we got uh, Sierra Leone basically is still an agricultural country. Yeah, let's go to one and more picture if we could. Farming. There we are. Okay. These these two lions have been carved, uh, carved by one of the premier artists in Sierra Leone, Marco, who was traveled the world, but makes many of the big statues for the, many of the hotels. Okay. Well, that's one that guy. Way. I'm talking about, is there an well, industry? Well, no, he, he has 20 young men working with him. Okay. But is there an industry in respect to doing this? No, but there is this one person who does excellent work who is well known. Mm -hmm. And there are others trying to learn. Yeah. But it's a slow process, Stan. And you actually have, yeah. you've had this for several years, but they, these are being made a lot. This is what the, bird what is this? It's called there? a bird in the cage. You, can, you might not be able to see it. Anyway, this is a very nice walking stick. And it's been very helpful to me because I fell and hurt myself, and I've used it hmm. ever since coming back and still do today. Well, and these are these generally available in the United States now? Not at this time. We're going to bring more of them here and sell these uh, walking sticks to help raise money to drill water wells in Sierra Leone in the very home areas of where the woodcarvers live. Okay, so what percentage of the, of the men work, have a job? I would say that the unemployment in respect to young, let me say young people, I can speak for sure, is a good 60% unemployment. So what do they do all day? Whittle? Hang around, play checkers, drink palm wine, try to find work, look for help, visit or uh, meet the tourists when they come in, beg for help. Right. Uh, it's, it's not a nice situation. Let's go to the next picture. This is uh, uh, actually two pictures of a, a woman and her crafts. <coughs> and um, one thing that we have learned here in uh, dealing with so many different developing countries, and we'll put Sierra Leone in the category of developing, is that women are the backbone of many, many societies. Is that true 
of Sierra Leone? It's true of Sierra Leone because under the present situation, it's the women who cook the food, gather the, the wood, carry the water, raise the children, and are there. Okay, so these men who are unemployed, who are drinking palm wine, waiting for tourists, begging, why don't they carry the wood? Why don't they carry the water? Is that not part of the culture? It, it could be, but it's not done. It's considered to be women's work, though that is changing. What's men's work? What's men's work? Good question, Stan. I often looked out and wondered myself. Um, Let me ask this. The, the woman, if, if we can go back to the picture of the women, the woman in the two what were it, tapestries, I guess the is batik, what they were. Yes. Yeah, batik. Um, if I were to want to buy them and then were to be able to actually to pay them, to pay her for, for those um, products, would she get to keep the money or would a man come and take it from her? Basically, these women here that did these pieces, you will be, you're going to be getting one of these okay. because it's about 20,000 leones which if you divide that by three is gonna give you an idea that's about six dollars oh. uh, what cost. Yes, she will keep the money. She'll get the to one keep that made, cause she was, This lady in particular worked in an arts and crafts center that made these here. Mm -hmm. And she was a single mother raising children. Her husband had been killed during the war. She still had three kids to support. Okay, well, let's go to something else that is actually is a, uh, is there's a beautiful beach called the Lumley Beach. Lumley Beach. Let's, let's go to the picture of this beach. It's just gorgeous. There's a gentleman painting. There's some other guys standing around. And then let's go to the next picture because it's a closer up picture of the guys who are standing around. They all seem to be on crutches because they only have one leg. Stan, this is a picture of one of five single leg soccer teams in Sierra Leone made up of many of the young men who suffered an amputation and want to still do something. And they play soccer because it's a national game known as football, but they don't have jobs. They get some support, but they want to occupy themselves in some way. Now they've been able to go with support to play games in um, Brazil and also England mm -hmm. and other places. Okay, right now I want you to help me okay. get this photo that you brought, or the, not photo, but a painting that you brought back. First off, tell me, where'd you get this painting? In the previous picture you just showed there, the artist with his back, Yeah. This is the, he made this painting. This is the Lumley Beach. This is the soccer team, the mm -hmm. single leg soccer team, practicing their soccer here. You'll notice mm -hmm. each of these men has only one leg. Yeah. Now in particular, this is the Lumley Beach, which is beautiful, and you see yeah. it there. Is this, is this the culture? Is it that most of the men, or a lot of the men, just have one leg? You'll see much of this in Sierra Leone because there, many of the amputees are on the street still begging and asking for help. Yeah. Many organizations have helped them, but there's still much to be done. Yeah. But this particular uh, oil painting here, this uh, hut that's in the back here, this facility here. Right up here. Part of Sierra Leone that's changed so much since I've been there. That is a Chinese bar and grill recreation site from the government of China because they have a very increased presence in China and this is where much of the entertainment goes. So the, the Chinese have an increased presence in, uh, in Sierra Leone. Absolutely. Well, and let me ask this. I mean, here's, here's that bar and grill. Okay, so there's this Chinese bar and grill. You've got 60% unemployment. Who's got the money to buy anything there? Not many people from the standpoint of what there is on the streets, and many of them will take and um, um, buy what they can, mm -hmm. you know, from, uh, from sellers there. Okay, let's, let's take the picture down okay. now if we could. And as we do that, <coughs> I, I guess what I need to do then is to get into this. You said that China is coming in with investment. And actually, I, I want to go to the next graphic because the next graphic is an article from, I believe, BBC News. Chinese cash targets Sierra Leone. Let's go to, it says, the Chinese have seen an opportunity, says the director of Sierra Leone's National Tourist Board. The Chinese are moving very fast in Africa, regardless of whether it is stable or not, they are taking a risk. And let's go to the next part of the quote. You have to take a risk in Africa if you want to succeed. The Chinese are in Sierra Leone taking a risk. The Chinese are some of the biggest capitalists and businessmen in this world today who are looking for opportunities because they have a large country, a huge population, and they need to do something for their own people. Well, so this is good for Sierra Leone then, if the Chinese are bringing in money, that creates employment, et cetera, et cetera. It is good 
if it actually develops something such as the repair of the hydroelectric dam, which keeps the electricity under control there. But what is of interest, Stan, the Chinese are bringing in their own workforces. They're not hiring locally. Really? The building of the parliament building, the National Defense Headquarters, the stadium in Sierra Leone and other areas are all imported Chinese workers who live in large um, um, housing areas, have their own um, cafeterias and their own casinos, their own air places for casinos. entertainment. Casinos? Yes, there are casinos there now, small but growing. And some of the biggest hotels are managed and owned by Ch a huge Chinese company. Well, forgive me, but it sounds to me like the Sierra Leonean government has, n has not negotiated a good deal at all if Chinese investment is coming in, but the Sierra Leonean people are not benefiting, or are they benefiting? Well, that's a good question because I'm not so sure that, um, it's, that the Sierra Leone people are not benefiting. Certain individuals in Sierra Leone in that country benefit. And that's been the history of Africa, to where a few people get all the riches and most of them end up with nothing. So you have a tribal lord? Tribal can be part of it, but even just the political situation. So it, it, it really g comes down to there's a small group in power that's making a lot of there, money. That is that. But Sierra Leone, like other African countries, is still very corrupt. Hmm. And there's still a lot of payoffs that are all taken. Right. If, you've got, if you had a revolution that ended four years ago, and then you have a corrupt government that is in that is bringing in investment, but it is not even, uh, there's, there's no equity in it from the Sierra Leonean people. Isn't that a prescription for more revolution? It's going to be, soon? yes. And I really believe, Stan, and I was thinking about this, this this afternoon, if there's no unemployment for these young people, no, no employment, that they will pick up the gun again and they will attack. They will take what they want, as the rebels did before. And it's very important. So what makes the Chinese feel secure? I, I don't know if they necessarily feel secure. They are manufacturers of weapons, in particular, in Africa. They do have the money to buy mercenaries to protect them, and they do. They have security forces there. Um, but they see this as an opportunity now to get in while they can and take and make what they want. You mentioned the World Health Organization is there. Is the UN there? The UN is there, but they pulled out, started pulling out because there's a, it's supposedly peaceful now. So now you primarily have the Mongolians representing the United Nations providing security at the UN court that's overseeing the Liberian dictator, the, oh, trial, the trial Charles, Charles Taylor. Taylor. Yes. Hmm. Interesting. I've got to move to something a little bit of a different topic now. Sure. And I want to take you back in your former life when you were uh, an American citizenship instructor and um, you worked with many people who were, uh, not only that English wasn't their first language, but uh, maybe, just maybe, English wasn't something that they were truly were interested in. Let's go to the graphic. Because here's the question, are, there, are terrorists being recruited inside the United States. There, is, uh, there are several articles, a very recent note. Let's go to the first article. F and the FBI is monitoring an Islamic group for terrorist ties. And this was, uh, U.S. anti-terror officials believe radical extremists have been in infiltrating this otherwise peaceful Islamic movement and are using uh, a U.S. organization as a cover to network with other extremists in the United States. Now, this was a year ago. In this have you seen evidence of this, or at least that's, that makes you suspicious, that there are terrorist elements inside the United States, maybe inside King County? Good question, Stan. I do believe that there have been peaceful groups that have been infiltrated, and much of their intent has been turned around. Um, the possibility is there. And um, I don't have any exact information, proof, Mm -hmm. But traveling as I do with people that have family members everywhere, my suspicions are increasing. They really are. I'm concerned. Let's go to the next uh, article because it was just from uh, several weeks ago. The next wave of terrorists are American born and bred. The conviction of uh, Shawhar uh, Matin Siraj in New York this month on charges that he planned to blow up the Times Square subway station and the revelation that he too had no apparent links to any Islamist terrorist groups. 
highlights the reality that self-radicalized terrorists also exist in the U.S. There are a lot of wannabes, people that uh, may not have a direct tie or have not been able to associate with Al-Qaeda or some other group, but feel that they can carry on and, and terrorize people. Well, let's say that I were going to recruit or I were, were wanting to create a terrorist cell. Would I go to the jails and do that? Yes. You go to the prisons and uh, you could begin recruiting right here in the King County Jail System. Absolutely. Would I go to the homeless shelters? You could find some of that. You could find uh, people that were of interest. How do you know that? Because, Stan, I've lived in one before. Before I went to Sierra Leone, I was in a homeless situation, and I've told this to people openly, but it's opened my eyes to much of what is available and much of what is not available. Are there people there that scare you in terms of potentially being a terrorist? There are some because of the way they come into this country, how they have remained in this country, and what they are doing while they are here. Where are they from? Many of them are from Africa. Are they of one particular religion? Of those that I've had contact with, they've been Islamic. Is there any kind of, of military or police presence that you can tell looking at any of this? Not that I'm aware of. That, that's got to be the last word. Um, sobering thoughts. We'll see you right here on Public Exposure next week.